Hello, welcome to another Pathfinders for Autism Zoomcast. I'm your host, Rob Long, and joining me today is Professor and Chairman of the Neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Peter Crino. Hey, Rob, how are you doing today? Doing well, thank you so very much for your time today. Sure. Uh, I guess let's just jump right into it. Can you explain to us exactly what the University of Maryland for Adults and Neurodevelopment uh, Disabilities, what that's all about? Sure, yeah, so the um, Clinical Center for Adults with Neurodevelopmental Disabilities, or was, as we affectionately abbreviated, CCAND, um, was uh, really um, my idea to come up with a strategy for uh, evolving continuity of care for adults with autism, epilepsy, and intellectual disability. The program itself is a partnership between the State of Maryland um, and the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Medical Center uh, to provide funding for nurse practitioners, social worker, genetics counselor, research coordinators, um, so that we can reach out to many folks across the state of Maryland who are battling autism, uh, epilepsy, intellectual disability, and who many find when they get to be the age of 18, 21, uh, physicians, practitioners, services uh, really become quite limited, and so we want to we want to provide a home for them. Dr. Crino, I, I know you. We were talking before you've been up and down the I ninety five corridor. Were you brought in to help develop this program, or no, you... not really. So it's kind of my. It was uh, just not self not self promoting, but it really was my idea. Um, so I I did uh, about twenty years at the University of Pennsylvania on faculty there, and I developed a similar program there. Uh, I have a particular interest in the genetics of epilepsy and autism, and so I had a program there to focus on a couple of neurological diseases, such as tuberous sclerosis complex, for example, um, and um, that's a genetic disease that has really probably 50% of patients have autism, about 80% have epilepsy, um, and so I set that program up there, and thinking I was going to see a few patients every now and again, and I started seeing two, three, four new patients a week, so there were lots of individuals who really needed these services, and then I've sort of expanded it out kind of in an omnibus fashion to all types of neurogenetic diseases that are linked to autism and epilepsy. And there's, I'm sure as you know, there's, there's quite a few of them. So, so I think it's been a good service. Um, patients come in, they're glad to know there's someone here. They don't have to explain autism. They don't have to explain epilepsy and genes. We know about that and we can have a conversation with the families. Dr. Crino, you said you have a particular interest in the study of autism and epilepsy. Uh, is that because of personal experience or just something you developed throughout your profession? No, I mean, I, I, I have not had personal experience in terms of a family member. And I, I will tell you, if, you know, as a practitioner, I've been in practice since 1996. I've met with lots and lots of families. I have nothing but the deepest respect for what families go through to handle the challenges of these disorders. Um, no, I, I really came upon it, to be honest with you, from a purely scientific initiative, which is that I was interested in how these genes lead to this complex behavioral array of autism uh, and also the abnormal circuits that lead to epilepsy and seizures. And so uh, it was an area, to me, was a very fertile ground for research. We still now in 2020 don't have a cure for autism. We don't really have a cure for epilepsy other than epilepsy surgery. So there's lots and lots still to do from the research perspective. Now, how do the services differ for adults versus what it might be for children? For sure. Yeah, no, it's a great question. You know, the, 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 uh, the concept that we're trying to bring forward is that autism is a, is a lifespan diagnosis. And I think a lot of individuals who aren't kind of doing this every day do forget that. Um, you know, of, of the one in 56, uh, you know, incidents of autism here in the state of, of Maryland, um, you know, the vast majority of those, of those individuals get to be 18, 21, and they still have a long life ahead of them. So, um, the services that are required for a child with autism are really quite different than for an adult. So, for example, for children, we're really focusing on early intervention, schooling, IEPs, getting them placed uh, in appropriate social environments, getting them to interact socially with uh, other children, having appropriate school settings for them, after school care, home care. Um, and the idea that we're really trying to intervene early and have as much stimulation, as much education, and really kind of build the network so that there's as much as possible. When you get to 21, um, it's a little different emphasis and it becomes more about things like vocational training, um, day programs for things uh, during the daytime for uh, individuals to participate in. Um, the other thing is the evolution of other medical problems that just crop up in adults. So people with autism and epilepsy have heart attacks and cancer and all diabetes and all the other stuff that affect adults. 
Um, and then also more complicated issues such as power of attorney, um, you know, uh, long-term care when their care caregivers who are their parents, for example, are no longer able to care. Um, things like, um, you know, putting together advanced directives and estate planning. All that kind of stuff comes into play as people get into their 40s and 50s, whereas in children, um, most of that stuff really is pressing. Yeah, and I've noticed uh, my son is um, autistic. He'll be 22 years old this year. And you mentioned autism and epilepsy mm -hmm. together the entire interview. I've never heard them brought together. Is there correlation between these two uh, conditions? There absolutely is. And so um, if you look at the studies that have been published in this area, the range uh, that has been estimated is that anywhere from 10 to 40 percent of individuals with autism will have epilepsy as a comorbidity. Um, now, of course, that means that a good number of folks don't have, don't have epilepsy as well, but it's, it's pretty high. And if you think that up to 50 percent of people with autism may have epilepsy and then compare that to the incidence of epilepsy in the general population, which is about 1 percent, uh, there's a huge, huge uh, effect of um, the genetic and molecular processes causing autism that somehow engender epileptic seizures. And so I often think about these two disorders, kind of epilepsy and autism, as sort of two overlapping Venn diagrams. There's plenty of folks with epilepsy who don't have autism and vice versa, but there's a pretty big overlap between individuals with autism and epilepsy. Uh, 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 seizures, is that a uh, First, let me go back, let me circle back. Sure. Uh, Epilepsy is something they can develop mm -hmm. after the fact, and you not know it initially? Absolutely. So the de remember, the definition of epilepsy is to have spontaneous recurrent seizures. The human brain is set up so that any person can have just one seizure, and that can happen after a motor vehicle accident, traumatic brain injury, a brain tumor, bleeding on the brain. Um, but when the brain begins to learn the circuitry so that it can have spontaneous recurrent seizures over and over and over again, that's the definition of what we call epilepsy. Many children who initially present with autism based on the behavioral findings will subsequently develop seizures, for example, as school-aged children. Many of them will have their first seizure as teenagers, and believe it or not, there is a second peak of epilepsy onset that's often seen in the mid-20s to early 30s. So yeah, in theory, any patient who has autism is at increased risk for developing epileptic seizures pretty much throughout the lifespan. Are there signs other than seizures that, that caretakers and parents can look for? So not really. Unfortunately, the defining feature of epilepsy is actually having the seizures themselves. And so uh, a common scenario I will see is either a child who developed um, early onset seizures was found to have autism, a child who was diagnosed with autism early on and then subsequently had seizures, or intriguingly, uh, a number of individuals who've had autism and they now are in their 20s and suddenly come in with a first time seizure and, and their parents are like, wow, where did, where did that come from? Uh, and it unfortunately is just part of the spectrum of things that can happen in autism. Uh, I will tell you there are a number of genetic disorders, Rob, for example, uh, tuberous sclerosis syndrome, another disorder known as Phelan McDermott syndrome. These genetic diseases are very close to link to known, uh, closely linked to known gene mutations. Um, and these gene mutations probably have a dual effect on the brain. One is causing a behavioral phenotype that we know as autism spectrum disorder, and the other is creating the circuit abnormalities that actually cause epileptic seizures. Oh, that's, that's, that's powerful stuff, Dr. Green. I appreciate all that information. Uh, but there may be people right now viewing this that want to know more. Uh, how does someone, you know, access these services and get in contact with your office? Yeah, for sure. No, we, we are, you know, we are uh, very much interested in uh, serving the folks here uh, in Baltimore and across the state of Maryland. We have some people who come in even from out of state, from the surrounding states, certainly in the D.C. area. Um, so uh, we have a, a number that's available. Would you like me to give the number? I'm happy. Please to do. Please yeah. do. 410-328-6266. Uh, and when you call, just ask uh, to have an appointment with me, Dr. Peter Crino, uh, or in the adult autism program and our uh, administrative assistants and our nurses will be able to facilitate getting an appointment. Obviously, we'll do our best to get you in as fast as possible. COVID-19 has made things a little challenging right now, but uh, we're, we're, Rob, we're largely doing televisits right now. But uh, in the last two months, I've done lots of new televisits and they've been uh, really, really great. Patients have liked them a lot. You know, uh, your organization and, and your practice is unbelievable, unbelievable service. And we know other unbelievable services, much like Pathfinders for Autism. 
Uh, how do organizations like that, in your opinion, support Marylanders and, and people in the autism community? Yeah, I mean, Pathfinders for Autism is, is just an incredible organization. And, and I had the privilege to attend one of the functions early in the year. Uh, sadly, in the times of pre-COVID, when we could all get together and, uh, you know, share some good fellowship. But, um, you know, the, the real thing that organizations can do, and for example, we have a wonderful partnership with the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance, which is present here in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, they're, they're, these kinds of organizations can provide really just invaluable help of getting the word out to people. I recently had a patient who was referred to me um, who has an adult uh, son uh, who has autism. And they, they said, we've been to five different doctors. No one seems to know what's going on. Can you help us at all? And, and we were like, yeah, this is what we do. Come on in. And, and it was just so, they were so happy to know that they could come in and people understood autism. We understand epilepsy. We're willing to listen to families to hear what they're going through. And so things like, uh, you know, sort of grassroots organization uh, like Pathfinders and Tuber Sclerosis Alliance, Galen McDermott Foundation, uh, they're just invaluable in getting people to our services and letting them know that we are here. And we want to partner with uh, Pathfinders for sure. And we want to be available for consultations, evaluations. Many people who have epilepsy have severe epilepsy and will need um, new types of medications, surgeries. There's even device-based therapies for epilepsy. So, so it really is a partnership, Rob, and it's really getting the word out so they know there's a place they can go. Dr. Peter Crino from uh, University of Maryland, uh, professor and chairman of the neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Thank you so much for your time today and uh, continue to do what you're doing for the autism community. Rob, thanks for chatting with me. It was really great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Dr. Crino, I need that, I need that number again. My son started